Okay, now on to our panel. That was a really interesting presentation about American and worldwide attitudes um, about the health crisis and the vaccine. Um, and now we're gonna talk to our panel. Uh, with me today, we have Huda al Kathari um, with the Ministry of Health at Qatar. Um, Huda is um, the acting director of healthcare quality and patient safety department and the acting director of Corporate Quality and Planning Department at the Ministry of Public Health in Qatar. She provides direction and leadership for the development of national strategies, policy, regulatory framework standards and guidelines for patient safety and healthcare quality. And Hatija Kitschuk is the Executive Director of the G20 Health and Development Partnership and leads the policy advocacy and communications work uh, for the G20. She helps over 25 leading health global organizations with their approach and support to G20 member states and other international fora with their global health agenda. And Jonathan Margolis is a career member of the Senior Executive Service at the State Department who currently serves as the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for Science, Space and Health in the Department of State's Bureau of Oceans and international environmental and scientific affairs and in this position he's responsible for policies and programs in the areas of international science technology cooperation space and advanced technologies and international health and biodefense and i know from covering the state department for 20 years that it's so interesting that these uh this you know science and health and and space is becoming much more of a conversation in international diplomacy. So looking forward to hearing more about that. Huda, let's start with you. Um, we're talking about this kind of ideal, aspirational global health security uh, paradigm. What does that look like in your view? Um, hello, everybody. Uh, well, uh, in Qatar, we have, we always had different platforms actually to contribute to global health securities. And I think like many other countries, we, uh, we continue to work on enhancing these different platforms. So one example I can share is actually the uh, Qatar Fund program, which has been very active in contributing to the uh, global health security agenda. And I, I I can share with you, of course, many examples of the different contributions that were made, or not only during COVID, but even before that, uh, whether it's financial support or contributing to uh, sharing experiences and uh, sharing, uh, uh, participating in different research related to these areas. And that is actually done at different levels. So uh, this is something we do uh, with uh, uh, our uh, regional area like GCC countries and EMRO region, but also collaboration with WHO and other organizations to, uh, to serve that purpose. Uh, so uh, some of the, uh, uh, I think, uh, another two good examples I can share with you uh, actually are uh, the, the, a couple of side events that we uh, organized uh, both with uh, WHO during the uh, World Health Assembly 72. That was focusing on the importance of quality and safety uh, during, the, uh, emer during emergencies and extreme adversities. And it was focusing on the importance of uh, the collaboration between all countries uh, to actually uh, contribute to global health security during addressing uh, that specifically during emergencies. And there were some a set of recommendations that we came up with uh, to encourage uh, the collaboration with all countries. Uh, another one that was also organized during the United Nations meeting, uh, the, the most recent one, which was less than a month ago, was focusing on encouraging and addressing actually uh, uh, children and youth, so how we support children and uh, young uh, people during uh, uh, emergencies such as COVID-19, for example. Uh, the, the contribution actually is, is something that we believe in and very, very much committed uh, to, um, uh, whether it's 
medications and whether it's uh, medical equipments and supplies and uh, uh, personal protective equipments and so on. So that is our really a commitment that we have to contribute and support not only how things are inside Qatar or at the national level, but also our neighbors and globally. Thank you, Huda. And um, Hatija, let's talk, uh, I mean, this whole idea of health security, uh, we think of security obviously in different um, ways, but now the kind of whole idea of, of health security in a healthy um, you know, country is, is so important. Let's talk about concrete measures governments can take at the multinational, national and local levels to strengthen their own health security. Thank you, thank you, um, Elisa. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for Meridian hosting us today. Um, indeed, uh, like, let me uh, take it maybe one step back and to explain to you a little bit um, what the G20 partnership does. Um, over, since 2017, the G20 uh, presidency led by Germany back then uh, has for the first time put uh, health on their global agendas. Um, of the G20. And back then, as you remember, we, we were dealing with the Ebola crisis and its management. So we, we were in, in the pandemic uh, back then. And uh, what, was, uh, what was very important in, when we created this partnership was um, that all the health organizations working on different areas were basically operating in silos. And uh, we, we were asked to break these silos and to, with, with the emerging globalization and the disruptions that are happening and the uh, security threats, including pandemics, that we look into um, common policy areas, how we can tackle these challenges together, which is why we have now over 25 global health organizations from the pharma sector, NGOs, academia, and a range of uh, G20 um, parliamentarians who are supporting us in our advocacy work. And the key thing what we realized back then is every time a crisis was happening or is happening, we are acting uh, like a disaster relief. Like we are putting money, uh, pu uh, putting the, uh, like filling up the pots, governments are rallying around it and uh, trying to uh, gather the money necessary to basically overcome a crisis. Uh, of and the effects we basically see years after and uh, it, it doesn't lead to any sustainable economic recovery. So I think what's what's key what we learned out of this COVID-19 pandemic, again, we the pandemic broke out, we had millions and billions put into national and global health systems, the WHO together with the European Union has led a fundamental initiative called the ACT Accelerator, gathering over um, 50 billion um, uh, thousand um, uh, US dollars for, for the pot to um, basically make sure that we have vaccines, treatments and tests and that we make them available to everyone globally. However, the problem again is uh, where, how can we make sure that this money uh, gets to the right people and how can we sustain or integrate the private sector into the future to uh, show to them that health actually is a positive investment. So to not make this longer, to come back to your questions, what nation, nations really need to do is look at their health investment strategies and look at why, make the case, case of why investment in health is a positive investment into economies, and then go back and see how they can integrate private investment, ethical investors, create bonds, to basically make uh, allow for sustainable financing mechanisms so that we achieve the sustainable development goal, uh, goals until 2030. Um, Jonathan, um, Hatija makes um, an important point about, you know, kind of private investment, but, you know, that also opens up the question of who should be involved in decision-making processes regarding global health. You know, should it just be the government what about doctors? What about pharma? What about you know uh, private financial institutions? How do you see that? Yeah, well, um, Elise, thank you very much for the question, and also to Meridian for convening this panel. A great opportunity to talk about a few things, and it's a great question that you phrased. Who actually should be participating in all those discussion points on key issues at a national level? Um, what I was hoping to do maybe is just to set the framework at the 
more international level just to start and happy to get to your question as I unfold, if that's all right with you. But what I wanted to point out, because you asked about national security and the security element earlier, is uh, I think one of the things, one of the lessons that just about everybody has learned at this point is that any country anywhere is at risk from an outbreak of infectious disease. And that's one of the reasons that the Trump administration has put forward in the national security strategy, this concept of uh, global health security, that we recognize it in the United States as a national security issue. And so what we need to be doing is building the capacities around the world so that countries can do exactly what you just described, take those decisions, make, take those ne necessary steps in the event of an infectious disease outbreak. There's a technical component to this, and this touches on some of the issues you've raised. And I think there's probably broad agreement on what are the critical issues that we need to do on capacity building, lab capabilities, surveillance capabilities, emergency response capabilities, to mention three specific areas where technical components and obviously the people involved in those technical issues would need to be involved in how you do that by country. But I think the important thing nowadays, especially, is the recognition that I think is growing. And that is that countries, nobody, has the opportunity to choose when the infectious disease will hit your country. And it means we always need to be vigilant. We always need to be ready. And that's one of the reasons the United States government was a founder of what we call the global health security agenda. And this is now an effort underway with 60 or more governments, non-governmental organizations and the like, focusing on capacity building, focusing on at the country level, raising a country's capacity to um, actually uh, prevent, detect, and respond to infectious disease outbreaks. Um, in incredibly important, and from the US perspective for what it's worth, fully consistent with the approach the United States has taken historically, 50 years of the United States investments internationally in global health issues in the broad uh, global health arena where we're probably the largest bilateral donor in the health arena uh, going around. So uh, you heard about the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. US was playing a central role there. If you look at HIV AIDS and what we did with the Global Fund and the President's Initiative on um, combating that PEPFAR. Uh, and you look at COVID as well, 20 billion, over $20 billion uh, expended on therapeutics, on vaccines uh, to create a safe and effective vaccine. Point I'm making, I hope, is that there's a long-term US government commitment to this effort we believe it does need to be at the national level, and we believe that there are any number of mechanisms to bring this forward. I'll just mention one. I talked already about the global health security agenda. Um, at the end of the day, every country ultimately, as you've already pointed out, it's a national level issue. Every country is going to need to be involved in that. Secretary Pompeo has underscored, in fact, recently, I think folks are probably familiar with on this call, the international health regulations where every country has signed up through the WHO, so that's signed up a uh, their responsibility to meet those. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm gonna. I'm sorry, Jonathan. I. I'm I, I, I. I get that. I. I understand the U.S. commitment, and it's a long-standing kind of U.S. commitment to, you know, the global health agenda. But I'm just kind of interested in, kind of the wider kind of non-governmental partnerships that can help. Um, obviously, the government can't do it alone, and I know pre uh, the president and his administration has made a real effort in terms of working with private industry. So maybe you could um, talk a little bit about more about that, about the whole of, not only whole of government, but whole of society approach to a global health security. Yeah, exactly right. And so thank you for the, uh, for the push. I think um, uh, you've hit it exactly. Um, when we think about global health security in the United States, we think about it as a whole of government approach, a one health approach and a whole of society approach. It really does take all the different elements in society. That means all the different federal agencies that are involved. And you certainly see that State Department, NIH, FDA, um, CDC, any number of others, but private sector involved as well. I can tell you that in the global health security agenda, we have a private sector group that is consulting directly with us and is actively engaged in promoting country at the country level, a various set of activities based on their own commercial interest and their own um, uh, company interests going forward, and certainly the NGO community exceptionally well involved, whether that's on the academic side, uh, universities, or on the NGO side, uh, advocacy, raising awareness of the importance of the importance of the issue of global health security. And uh, the federal government thinks that's absolutely essential to have that full partnership of all elements uh, of society involved in the effort going forward. Um, Huda, to, over to you, I'm going to ask this of all of you. Um, is the premise of this session 
that public interest and support for global health issues is rising. Um, do you do you agree with that premise? Is that valid? Buddha. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Uh, uh, I mean, if, if if I'm not sure if you had the chance to look at the national health strategy of Qatar for the period uh, 2018 to 2022, but it does focus on uh, health security, national health security, which is of course contributing to global health security, and it does also affect. Uh, it looks at the system in general not only when we face any pandemic, but also uh, in, in the normal situation where we actually need to focus and put our efforts in preparing, being very well prepared for situations like this. So uh, one of the key pillars, for example, which focuses on system-wide priority is uh, developing an effective system of governance and leadership. Uh, another pillar focuses on health protection and I mean, many of these pillars actually uh, help us uh, be very well prepared to play that role, which, which I totally agree that it is very valid. It is very important. And I can see, I mean, um, I mean looking at the progress reports that we have and, and how things are, how we are achieving our national health strategy, uh, we can see that there is a very good progress that was made uh, which is completely and beautifully aligned with the global uh, health security agenda. Now, of course, during COVID-19 pandemic, the progress has slowed down, but at the same time, I mean, it, it had some negative effect uh, on, on our national efforts, but at the same time, it did positively affected some other areas. For example, it has, it accelerated the pace where our this transformative change that we we're, we're talking about actually happened. So even though we had planned for um, uh, electronic surveillance systems, for example, and providing services online, uh, the pandemic actually accelerated this uh, uh, service provision, which was virtual. So we we were able actually to still provide services to certain groups and uh, of the population uh, with focus more focus on uh, elderly and special people with special needs and people with chronic conditions. So um, the pandemic forced us or helped us actually accelerate the provision and finding different ways of making sure that services actually are provided to these groups of the population. Uh, there were areas where we were actually, uh, you know, there were, if I can call pressing health issues and areas of focus for us, such as road traffic accidents, for example. Uh, the pandemic actually helped us improve the numbers that we had, and we definitely would like to continue having that. Other areas, uh, for example, like um, um, mental health and uh, and also uh, chronic some other conditions like obesity and diabetes and low physical exercise even though businesses were closed for example but we were encouraging people to go and have uh, more movement physical exercise we one of the first areas we actually opened were parks and that to encourage people to go and and do some movement and help themselves uh, and shisha for example was the first thing that we stopped. So we we had improvement in this area. So it helped us a lot actually have some improvements that we would like to continue having and invest in, uh, in, in uh, during this after COVID. Uh, another excellent example was how the whole system actually started working together, not only at the, at the health system level where we had a much better coordination and integration, but also at the level of the country. So the whole government approach and uh, the cross-government collaboration. So we learned to work together uh, as one team and as one entity rather than different entities. And it was really an excellent experience that uh, we learned a lot from. 
Uh, Hatija, uh, talk about the um, idea of, of the rise in, in uh, kind of public interest and support for health, but I also want to ask you that this year's G20 summits have historically convened not only ministers of finance, but ministers of health. And how do you think the health agenda is going to play out uh, at next month's G20? I know the idea of, of a financial approach is, is um, very important. Yeah, thank you, uh, Elisa. So actually, there are three components, if you ask me, on the rise of public interest. First of all, um, climate change is a topic to our heart and uh, it raises, it will affect us all in the future. And we have successfully um, seen over the past few years how the G20 has created a momentum to uh, leverage public and private um, uh, awareness towards these issues. But health, as Joe in his uh, like study just showed to us in the survey, affects us all directly. This is why we're sitting at home today, right? So on, on our everyday lives, which is why it's important for all of us. It affects us all if we don't act now. On the government level, it was quite interesting, Elisa, when we went to G20 um, finance ministers um, before we compiled our report last year to show new financing models to sustain health financing for the future, they, uh, they didn't want to open their doors to us and they said, oh, please go to the health ministry, you're receiving our funds. And now for the first time when the COVID-19 pandemic broke out, uh, finance ministers got interested simply because why? Businesses are closed, investors are complaining. So they realize the factor that they have to act now. And um, on the multilateral level, just to come uh, before I come to your G20 point, on the multilateral level, we have seen for the first time that the WHO and the IMF were collaborating hand in hand and as you, as many of you may know, the IMF has an um, Article 4 procedure where governments uh, basically give a um, report of their uh, economic health every year. And uh, for the first time, the WHO spoke with the IMF about whether they should integrate health metrics into these annual IMF reports to basically integrate and raise more awareness and see health as an economic factor for government's decision making and on the multilateral space. So on the 21st of November and 22nd of November, G20 leaders will meet. And in fact, it's actually for the second time that G20 health and finance ministers are meeting after Tokyo last year. But uh, interestingly enough, um, it, it wouldn't have happened if it was for COVID-19. So the question is, why do we always have to face a crisis in order to you know, see it? And uh, our wish would be as the G20 partnership that this um, joint health and finance ministers meeting continues as a standing item every year uh, to prevent the next pandemics like AMR and non-communicable diseases, which will hit our economies by over like almost 50 uh, uh, trillion in by 2030. So when it comes um, to keep it short to the agenda item for next month, what's very important is that the G20 has for the first time recognized in their recent joint health and finance ministers meeting that health is a positive investment into economies, that collaboration is needed, that multilateral banks have to collaborate with governments and the private sector to make sure that countries and people get the access to vaccines, treatments and therapeutics, especially in low and middle income countries. And this is why they're doing a gap analysis right at the moment as we speak uh, to figure out how we can close the existing funding gaps uh, in this pandemic and how we can make sure that we prevent the next pandemic to come. And finally, uh, one of the major initiatives, which I congratulate the G24 is they implemented the debt suspension uh, initiative. And this helped obviously low and middle income countries to basically put their debt to the IMF and other institutions aside that they can focus that money and invest it into their uh, COVID uh, responses. Jonathan, I want to talk about what the State Department is doing in the area of global health diplomacy and how your office, um, including the Office of International Health and Biodefense, is involved. This is certainly a new kind of area that we don't traditionally, as I was saying, like I've, I've covered the State Department for a long time and you traditionally don't hear about that, but it sounds like these, these kind of um, scientific areas are becoming much more important in global health diplomacy. 
Uh, Lisa, exactly right. And, and really, it's two sides of the same coin, if you think about it, what we need to be doing. Uh, the Office of International Health and Biodefense in the State Department, in the Bureau of Oceans, and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs, it works both on this idea of global health security agenda, meaning what do you do to build capacities when there isn't an outbreak so that you are helping countries and working with those countries when we're not in a crisis situation, as Hatice was saying. Um, but also we need to have the ability to obviously to respond when there is a crisis. And let me give you just an example um, of why you need both capabilities and to your, the issue you had just previously raised. If you think right now of the outbreak of Ebola in the, in the DRC, um, one of the lessons that we've learned is it's really important to have the community buy-in for what you're trying to do in terms of response in that case. And so whether it's the State Department, AID, our, our embassies overseas, finding ways to engage the local communities so that they understand what the health interventions look like and so that there's ground level support for the activities that the governments are trying to undertake. That's something that we in the State Department fund fundamentally believe in. It makes you know, a country responsive to the needs of its people. And it's, uh, as we were talking about earlier, having the full interagency capability to do that through AID, through other agencies and through uh, NGOs on the ground who can build that community awareness and community buy-in, tremendously important in today's world. Okay, I don't wanna put you on the spot and I don't wanna talk about politics to be sure, but I do wanna ask you um, about the, you know, you're talking about working with US AID and other government agencies. So when you look at the US withdrawal from the WHO, I just wanna talk, I don't wanna talk about politics. I just wanna talk about the impact of looking forward. Are you concerned that, um, you know, investment will no longer leverage the experts in kind of CDC, NIH, USC, AID, because other countries will have to diversify their partnerships away. And so just describe what a global health security framework using all these agencies looks like without the WHO as a kind of coordination mechanism? And how do you get global success against these future disease outbreaks um, you know, without that as the, as the cent serving as the central coordination role? Yeah, so um, the, the United States obviously has a wealth of technical expertise, whether in the US government agencies throughout our, our healthcare system, um, and certainly our research capabilities are, 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 are phenomenal, are, are world-class obviously. And so um, the United States will continue to engage internationally, whether it's through our bilateral partnerships, through some of the mechanisms I just described, the global health security agenda. Um, there are any number of, of really important capabilities and, and opportunities for the United States to continue to bring the technical expertise to bear that we need to going forward. Uh, we've committed, as I've mentioned already, we're doing a tremendous work um, in, in, on Ebola response, on any number of other sorts of activities internationally on health. And that, that commitment from the United States government uh, to bring that technical expertise to bear will always be there. Um, Huda, um, Qatari health representatives have always been this strong proponent, not just in health, but in a lot of other areas for robust global cooperation. How do you feel that a multilateral approach can also solve non-COVID issues? Um, well, as I mentioned previously, is uh, I think we, we already do have different platforms for this uh, multilateral collaboration and, and coordination. And we definitely would like to continue using these platforms. And we, of course, definitely also want to build new collaborations uh, uh, and, and different means. Uh, so maybe if I can give you practical examples, uh, Qatar Airways, for example, was it, it's a hub for uh, different destinations and uh, it had a very important uh, role actually uh, in uh, not only for COVID, but for, for any other uh, non-COVID emergency, for example. Uh, so it, it, was, it, it had a very important role in, in repatriation of some of the people who were not able to go back to their countries during the pandemic, because unlike uh, many other uh, airlines, it did not stop uh, uh, completely. So it was still providing um, 
uh, opportunity and a chance for some people to move from one area to another area. So uh, stranded people who were not able to go back to their countries, uh, um, uh, we use that as a platform actually to help people move from one area to another area. Um, uh, antimicrobial resistance as a, implementing as one health approach, uh, which is completely aligned with World Health Organization uh, and the, the uh, Organization for Animal, Animal Health uh, Agenda. So that's another example. Okay. Uh, actually, there are many other examples, so. Good, good. Um, Hatija, um, we have a question from the audience. Is the topic, you know, Huda talked about mental health um, in uh, some areas. Is, is the topic of mental health gaining prominence in, in wider global health discussions, do you think? Yeah, I think um, what, I'm, what I'm observing at the moment is that um, obviously what Huda is working on, the matter, for example, of patient safety, healthcare worker safety, is a matter that comes under COVID at the moment because most of our health workers and patients are, um, are affected by this. And in fact, we have a shortage of 6 million nurses at the moment worldwide. Uh, at the same time though, um, the Italian presidency next year, I think they are starting to look at um, interlocutors, like how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting uh, patients, health and well-being, but also their mental health, right? So how, how are normal people affected by just working from home? How does it affect people to not be able to see families and the, the different variations of lockdown restrictions? So these are policy uh, issues that will surely be high on the agenda uh, next year. Also, just uh, worth mentioning, the G7 is next year in, in the country I am in the United Kingdom and mental health is a big policy matter for the UK. And uh, there are already discussions about how much it impacts uh, the health of all of us in addition to the uh, health emergencies we're facing. Okay, this one's for Jonathan. Um, you know, we've seen particularly in the United States that there's kind of this mistrust of the government in terms of, you know, medical and health advice from citizens. Regarding um, Joe's presentations moving forward, how do you think governments can gain trust in medical and health advice from their citizens? Um, you know, uh, it's a great question and I really appreciate Joe's uh, statistics and uh, all the charts that he was showing earlier. I, I don't think it'll surprise you to know that uh, the kinds of challenges that we face here in the United States from a skeptical pu uh, public that's been out there for quite some time, um, it exists in other countries as well. Other countries have difficulties with vaccine acceptance, not only in the United States, um, and so that's an issue that's out there. Question of how do you build trust? Um, I'm gonna actually take a page, not out of the health arena, but out of the space arena and just give you an example of something that um, I just heard recently that our colleagues in Canada are doing on, on an issue of space resources. And they're, they're undertaking a listening session. They wanna engage with NGOs. They wanna engage with the commercial sector. They wanna create a government process that builds trust by having the ability to have all of the views represented, heard and responded to. And it's, to me, that's, that's a good governance practice. It's great to be able to cite not only, that's a standard practice we use in the United States, the whole of government approach, the whole of society approach, but seeing other governments take that on and really building within a particular country, the whole of society buy-in, I think that's the crucial step. Um, Huda, here's another question from our audience. How do multilateral initiatives better reach people at the local level? Uh, you mean in Qatar? No, I just mean in general. I'm, I mean, how do you, I'm, I'm, how do you, how, how do multilateral institutions work together to kind of reach people at the local level, whether in Qatar or, or other countries? Mm -hmm. uh, I think as uh, Hatija was uh, mentioning that it is, it's really important that we work with different countries and organizations to to actually um, serve that purpose, to make sure that it does not go only to um, organization for only like uh, to provide some sort of an admin support or to research, but it actually goes to people on the ground who, who are in need. And I think maybe this can be done between organizations uh, 
the different organizations uh, to make sure that um, based on any agreements that it does actually reach to the people on the ground who are in need. Whether we're talking about patients or we're talking about labs or we're talking about research efforts and so on. Um, Hatija, do you want to you want to pick that one up? Yeah, yeah, I would like to make a comment for that, Huda. Um, so, with uh, how multilateral uh, initiatives can be supported um, uh, on the ground to raise awareness is actually a very good example. With Corona, is the Global Act Accelerator the coronavirus response supported by many countries, including Qatar actually, but unfortunately not the United States, uh, to basically make sure that treatments, vaccines and therapeutics get to the people. And what we have been doing on the testing space of this is we have been using women political leaders, uh, especially in low and middle income countries who, uh, who don't have daily access to the testing they need, who don't have capabilities. And these political leaders uh, in these countries have helped us to uh, raise awareness in the population. Where is the problem? Why is testing so important to know how to treat the patient against COVID-19, be it the vaccine, an alternative treatment? How do we isolate? So this kind of campaign, when, it, when the international uh, agenda is set by multilaterals uh, and it's supported by parliamentarians around the world, and this is where the new role of parliamentarians, in my view, comes into play, because they have been a bit fallen off uh, in, in the global um, international organization space when it comes to uh, like any health emergencies. So they have a new role to take up these messages and portray it uh, and give the messages to their populations. And in the testing space, I must say, we have recognized that having local um, like mayors, your female mayors or councillors or even NGOs, activists. It has helped a lot to raise awareness of why people should be testing, how they should be isolating. Uh, and it helps more, believe me, than when you just hear it from the TV and when government changes their opinion on a day to day basis of how you should isolate. Um, something that we've been um, kind of talking about throughout the summit, it's a recurring question. And I wanna ask this to all of you. We've been asking leaders who've been sharing their perspectives with us the following question. And I'm just gonna ask it to each of you. If you were the quote unquote world pandemic czar today, what's one action you would take first to help protect lives and livelihoods? Um, Uda, let's start with you. Yes, uh, it's a big house. Uh, I think, um, I mean, building on our own experience, the one thing that we uh, uh, had actually was to quickly respond. Uh, it was how fast we were able to respond. And I think this is a key thing. So one day can make a big difference. One week can make a, bit, a big difference. So if, if there is one thing that I would do actually in, in a response to a pandemic, uh, if I'm uh, in a leadership position and I can uh, come up with these uh, decisions is actually a quick response, a quick response to uh, a pandemic as, as early as there is an alert about something going on. So um, uh, it can save lives. It can save a lot of, money and it can save a lot of efforts as well and above all of that and i think more importantly it can uh, help uh, preventing uh, the the further uh, spread of any pandemic that we have jonathan over to you what's the one action you would take first to help kind of protect lives and livelihoods yeah so look uh so much of those one actions, they're already taking place. I don't have to point them out. You've got to invest in vaccines. The United States has done that clearly. You, you've got to just have a have awareness raised across uh, across the globe about the importance of the issue. That's clearly taking place. So um, you know, it, it may sound small, and it's not exactly what you've asked, but it's, it's why it's important to have fora like this, where you can bring out of the limelight, out of the spotlight 
people together to actually talk about what are the issues, what are the troubles that we're having. It's not the first thing you might do. I know that was your question. It's not the first thing you might do, but it is, it's a complementary action. And I think it's really important to be able to have these kinds of conversations in the context of the ongoing broader COVID-19 effort. Okay, and um, Hadija, your worldwide pan pandemic czar, of course, you're kind of acting in, in that way in some ways as, as kind of coordinating uh, the G20 uh, action. What's the one action you would take first to save lives? I think, first of all, I would put aside any political conflicts and uh, uh, stop this protectionism from governments uh, when and let international organizations like the WHO do their work when they uh, have to do it and um, basically be together with them, uh, collaborate and uh, portray the same message to your populations and be, uh, be clear about what the money you're going to spend on, how it will help and affect your populations. And most importantly, for the next pandemic and to recover from this pandemic, make sure that we set clear measures in place that whenever the next pandemic breaks out, we have a global pot where we can withdraw and help each other to create a global mechanism. And the Global Pandemic um, Monitoring Board, for example, they are doing a gap analysis of pandemics uh, and now for COVID-19. And we have to look at a global pot that we can use and support each other globally uh, for countries that are in need uh, and to give a quick response with a common voice rather than fighting against each other. Um, this is something that came up, Hadija, at the other um, panel. Um, <laughs> does there need to be a global consensus to make a vaccine a kind of global public product where this is a you know, political commitment for you know, highest risk populations first, regardless of where they reside, do you think? Yes, I think, uh, especially in this time of the pandemic, um, a vaccine has to be seen as a public good. I know that there are reservations, obviously, from nations, but uh, access needs to be allowed, and uh, we need to procure and give access to as many vaccines as possible, especially in low- and middle-income countries. Because let's not forget, even if we eliminate COVID in, in the UK or in Qatar or in the United States, we still have it in other countries, and it's a transnational crisis, right? So let's make this a public good. Okay, um, as we close, I think we're all looking for a silver lining here after COVID left so much death and destruction to our lives. Are there ways in which this pandemic and the way the world uh, responds be a force for good um, in, in global health security, building resilience into the system? Um, Huda, why don't we start with you first? Um, <clears throat> well, there, there are many silver linings, actually, and lessons learned out of this experience. Uh, one of them was actually um, uh, is, is making this as an opportunity, actually, to uh, address our gaps. And uh, I think somehow, or and to, to a certain level, uh, we've managed to do that because um, for example, staffing and human resources has been in, in healthcare sector, for example, has been an issue for quite some time. Uh, during the pandemic, one of the things that we're, we managed to do and helped us a lot was the redeployment and redistribution of uh, healthcare workers, uh, not only within the government sector, but also between the government, the semi-government and the private sector. So that was a really good experience that we would definitely like to continue and invest in. Uh, the, the other one was actually the collaboration and the, co the, the coordination across the government uh, between the different government sectors. Uh, and I'm, again, I'm talking about uh, uh, us as a country uh, at the national level and how the different government entities and also the non-government entities uh, uh, has come, have come together actually to work uh, and, and, as, and participate and take their roles in this pandemic. Uh, that was really uh, something beautiful. At the global level actually is uh, the, uh, the collaboration and cooperation with other countries and 
sharing experiences and learning from each other. Uh, that was really an amazing thing, uh, which is, uh, which continues to happen. Uh, the, uh, the different efforts that we had at different levels of pe making people come together, share their experiences, learn from each other, whether we talk about legislation, uh, policies, guidelines, uh, uh, and even at, at the level of the, the vaccines and the medications and experiences from uh, all the countries, that was really uh, an excellent opportunity. Okay, um, thank you. Um, Jonathan, we need to close up, but just quick words, silver lining. Maybe this, um, you know, the hardest thing to do with global health security is when you don't have an outbreak, maintain that focus of governments so that even when there's not a crisis, you can still build those capacities. If anything has brought home the need to do that, I think the effects of COVID have done that. So I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful that the silver lining is countries are much more willing to invest in their national healthcare systems. Okay, and uh, Hadija, um, very quickly, um, I'm, getting the, I'm getting the signal, I'm getting the signal okay. to wrap. But okay. So I would say, on. okay, don't, let's not reinvent the wheel, learn from the best practices. And as Huda said, we, uh, we had a good experience how governments, governments and international organizations shared experiences. Let's use these to create measures to, um, to be more preventative for the next pandemic to come because what you can't uh, measure, you can't fix, right? So let's okay. good, good word to end on. Um, I want to thank my panelists and also Joe Daly from Gallup. And um, I, I think we can all uh, invite you to um, go back into the uh, main um, plenary session for, for the last, um, for, the, for the closing of the summit. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Elisa. Thanks, Elisa. And thanks to Joe. Thank you.